Welcome to Enter the Unknown, your one-stop shop for answers to questions that you were never bored enough to ask. My name is FJ, and today we're going to be attempting to answer the question, can you beat Pokemon Crystal using only Cleffa? It's been a long time since I've done a solo run. I don't think I've made one since Mime Jr. and Platinum, which was November? In my experience, they're typically much faster to record and edit, so after every challenge I've done this year being incredibly time-consuming, I'm going for a simpler one. They are especially quick in the first three generations, which is why that's the majority of what you see. I've done Azuril and Emerald and Mime Jr. and Platinum, so I thought I'd continue the baby Pokemon solo runs with Cleffa and Crystal. As we're in Gen 2, we're pre-physical special split, which isn't ideal for a normal type whose dominant attack is special. That normal typing will become a pretty major problem later on, but we'll get to that when it comes up. Shuckle is the only Pokemon in existence at this point who has a lower base speed stat than Cleffa, which means we're probably going to spend the majority of this run being hit first. The rules are pretty basic. We're not allowed items in battle, but held items are fine, and we will need some random Pokemon to use HMs throughout, because Cleffa can only learn Flash. I think that's about it, so let's get into it. Having replaced Totodile using the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, we select Cleffa as our starter and nickname her Yara. Starting out with Pound, Charm, and Encore, Cleffa isn't too bad in the beginning. Those are three of the five moves that Cleffa can learn by level up, but later on we'll be able to teach her some pretty decent TMs. Statistically, Cleffa is slow and physically weak, but her special stats are pretty respectable, so at least there are some positives. After meeting with Mr. Pokemon and Professor Oak on Route 30, we cross paths with a trainer on our way back to New Bark Town. Our red-haired rival stole Chikorita from Elm's lab, but with a couple of charms we can weaken the Grass-types tackle massively. In the end, it's a pretty simple battle with Pound taking down Chikorita before Yara's even lost 10 HP. Back at the lab, we name our rival Spork in parentheses, for some reason. I'm really not sure why. Also, I actually call those brackets, but parentheses is a much more fun word to say, so we're going with that. Clef is actually pretty solid in the early game, so it's a casual stroll to make it to Violet City. Our first stop there, mostly just for levels, is Sprout Tower. I'll probably never use Flash, but it could come in handy at some point. By the time we challenge Elder Lee, Yara's made it to level 12 and learned Sing, which will likely be key throughout the game. Relying so heavily on a 55% accuracy move is going to be pretty frustrating, but status moves can be game changers in runs like these. After a couple of successful Sings, Cleffa reaches level 13 and learns Sweet Kiss. That's it for level up moves. Proving that the 55% accuracy will more or less hold throughout, Yara takes three turns to put Hoot Hoot to sleep, finishing the battle with three hits out of five. Pound takes down the Sleeping Owl, which hands us the win so we can move on to Faulkner. The Violet City Gym Leader is basically never an issue in any challenge unless you're trying to do a Mimic-only run. Faulkner will absolutely call for Mud Slap on your Sudowoodo, and that cannot touch Pidgey, but that is a problem of the past. Cleffa has no real issues. Sing and Pound are quickly becoming a powerful combination, and the addition of Charm against Pidgeotto nullifies his attacking prowess. In the end, it's a pretty easy victory for Cleffa, who finishes the battle with almost half of her HP remaining. Zephyr Badge in hand, we can head onwards to Azalea Town. There aren't any mandatory battles on Route 32, but we take down most of the trainers for experience anyway. Union Cave is more or less the same. It's free of force battles, but I actually skipped most of these. I really wasn't in the mood to take down an Onyx or Geodude using only Pound. The next semi-relevant battle on our journey comes against the final Rocket Grunt in Slowpoke Well. His only Pokemon is level 14 Coughing, but that's a pretty bad matchup for Yara. Smog immediately poisons Cleffa, which changes up the strategy for this one. Instead of putting Coughing to sleep, we now need to confuse the Poison type to hopefully get some more damage in before Yara faints. Sweet Kiss does just that, but we still need a healthy dose of luck. Misclicking and selecting Charm instead of Pound is a bit of a setback, but we get the luck over the next few turns. Coughing repeatedly hits himself in confusion, which allows us to finish the battle off with two hit points remaining. That was probably closer than it should have been. Alright, Bugsy's up next. The Azalea Gym Leader starts out incredibly slowly. Metapod and Kakuna are rarely capable of causing trouble aside from Poison Sting, but on this occasion they both sleep through the whole battle. Cleffa wipes them both out without getting hit, leaving only Scyther. Missing the first thing against the Bug Flying type means Yara's hit by Quick Attack and Fury Cutter, but she connects on her second attempt. A single pound wakes up Bugsy's ace, but after Fury Cutter, Sweet Kiss leaves him confused. From there, Scyther just goes on an abysmal run. Cleffa isn't touched for the rest of the battle, marching to victory with pound and confusion damage. Yara's legs are probably too short to march, actually. More of a waddle, I guess. That takes our badge count to two, and we really haven't had too much trouble as of yet. Before we can leave Azalea Town, though, we've got to take down Spork at the edge of Ilex Forest. Prior to getting started, we have to teach Cleffa Mudslap. 
It's the only attack that Yara can learn at this point that can actually affect Ghastly. Otherwise we'd be relying on confusion damage which would probably take a while. As Ghastly's only attack is Lick, we're not actually at risk here. There's nothing he can do to deal damage unless he uses up all of his PP. Cleffa manages to knock out the ghost with a few mud slaps and Zubat's next in line. It takes a couple of tries but once Sing connects the poison type is done for. Three jabs of pound take Spork down to just his starter. Does it still count as a starter if you stole it? Let's just say his first Pokemon. Since our last battle Chick Reed has evolved into Bayleaf which makes this a pretty tough face off for Cleffa. After putting the grass type to sleep Yara takes advantage of the time to lower his accuracy with Mud Slap. The not very effective attack deals almost no damage but that's not what we're using it for. Even after Bayleaf wakes up, he misses 4 out of 5 attacks which allows Cleffa to whittle him down with Pound. After defeating Spork, we're allowed to move on heading through the forest to Goldenrod City. As it's Sunday, we can visit the department store and seeing as Yara's attached to us, receive the TM for return. That can replace Pound and will likely serve as our main physical attack for the remainder of the game. With that, we can go straight after our next gym badge. Whitney can cause a lot of problems, but our moveset is almost custom built to annoy Miltank. We've got Sing to break up any rollout combo and stop healing with Milk Drink, Charm to lower her attack and Mud Slap to make any attacking more difficult. Even though she's a step further up the evolutionary chain than Yara, Clefairy isn't up to much and goes down pretty easily. As soon as Miltank enters the battle, she stomps on Cleffa, which is pretty devastating. One more and it's over, so Cleffa connecting with Sing was absolutely vital. That enables a Charm Offensive that bottoms out Miltank's attack, which means the rollout she strikes with upon awakening barely even registers. After a couple of mud slaps, Yara connects with Sing once more. That keeps Miltank asleep for long enough to lower her accuracy further, but Stomp still hits its mark when she wakes up. Thanks to Charm, it's done enough to KO Cleffa, but it does leave her with just 5 HP. Luckily, Miltank's hooves don't really fit in her ears, so Sing puts her back to sleep and that'll do it. A series of returns take out Whitney's ace, earning us the very creatively named Plane Badge. Alright, that's all we really need to see in Goldenrod, so now we can move on to Ecritique. This is where being a normal type becomes a massive issue. The kimono girls don't cause any problems, but things start to get frustrating in the burn tower. Spork leads off with Haunter in this rival battle, and that's really bad for Yara. Haunter cannot attack with Lick, which means it will, in my experience, always start things off with Curse. That cuts away half of Haunter's HP, but it places a Curse on Cleffa that wipes out a quarter of her hit points at the end of every single turn. In a tough battle against a team of four, that makes things next to impossible. So what I had to do was give Yara the Quick Claw and then reset the battle until we got everything we needed. That is a Quick Claw pop, a successful sing, and Haunter staying asleep long enough to get a Mud Slap knockout, which is 5 turns. It shouldn't come as a shock to you that getting all of those things to happen took a ridiculously long time. I could have leveled Clef up to the point where one-shotting Spork's whole team was an option, but that would have taken a high level. Anyway, now that we've taken down Haunter, let's hope the rest of this goes well because otherwise I'm probably just going to give up. Magnemite only manages to confuse Cleffa but it doesn't stop a quick knockout and Zubat can't do much better. Yara takes Spork down to just Bayleaf with almost 3 quarters of her HP intact. Combining Sing and Return, Cleffa wipes out Bayleaf too without any real risk of losing. If a single ghost made Yara's life that difficult, I'm really not looking forward to facing Morty. The Acritique Gym Leader starts out with his Ghastly and as once again we're facing an opponent whose only attack is Lick, we're back to dealing with Curse. This first run basically called for a reset right away. There is just no way we're taking down Morty's whole team with 4 mud slaps. As you can probably tell from the 11 level jump, there were quite a large number of failed attempts that I just skipped. By this point, Cleffa's speed stat is high enough to outspeed Ghastly, so mud slap strikes first. That's still not enough to take down the ghost type who is 24 levels below us. For some reason though, Morty doesn't call for curse this time, instead calling for spite. That means we can make it past Ghastly with full health and no curse. We definitely aren't quicker than Haunter though, so he makes sure to set up that curse right away. That's not too bad though, because one mud slap finishes the job and as we scored a knockout, the curse doesn't kick in just yet. Gengar's up next and although his hypnosis puts Cleffa to sleep, she's holding a mint berry. Some incredible luck gets us past Gengar with misses on hypnosis and a crit mud slap. That gets us to Morty's final team member with a decent chunk of health remaining. Haunter has no way to damage us, but thanks to Ghastly Spite, after a mud slap, we are out of PP. So close. That means Curse finishes off Yara and we have to go again. Okay, we've jumped another couple of levels and countless attempts here. After a mud slap, Ghastly once again goes for Spite, but this time it fails. That's a perfect start. Cleffa takes down Ghastly and so far she's untouched. Haunter's up next and Yara actually managed to outspeed the evolved ghost. 
Mudslap takes him below half health before Morty calls for her hypnosis. The Mintberry Clef is holding wakes her up right away, which allows her to finish things off with another Mudslap. Okay, Morty's last two Pokemon don't know the move curse, so we have a chance here. There is no time pressure anymore. We can take as many turns as we need. Gengar misses his first hypnosis, allowing a Mudslap, but connects to put Yar to sleep on the second attempt. That means Morty can call for Dream Eater, which is the only attack it can use against Cleffa. Waking up after a single Dream Eater signals the end though. With every mud slap, Hypnosis becomes less likely to connect. Eventually, Gengar faints and now only Morty's second Haunter remains. After a single mud slap, Haunter uses Spite, so we are out of PP again. Haunter can't touch us though. At one point, it mimics return and gets a few hits in, but that's all the damage dealt until we make it to struggle. Although we have more total power points than Haunter, Spite is constantly reducing ours, so we run out first. Cleffa's final move is Sing, and it's used to put Haunter to sleep before we finally reach Struggle, hitting a crit to pick up the win. Okay, that took forever, but I think there's only a couple of Ghost-type curse users left for us to face, so that's good news. Thanks to our massive overleveling, the next few gyms shouldn't be too bad. I'd like to grab the TM for Icy Wind as quickly as possible, because that might come in handy, so let's head for Mahogany Town first. We breeze past the Red Gyarados at the Lake of Rage and then destroy Team Rocket in town with the minimal help of Lance. That leads us to Price whose levels are just way too low to cause us any problems. One return wipes out Seal, two take down Dugong and although Piloswine manages to freeze Cleffa with Blizzard, she defrosts quickly and return gets the job done again. That earns us the Glacier Badge, taking us up to 5 and we're headed for Cianwood next. Before visiting the gym we pick up the secret potion that we promised to Jasmine like a year ago? That's really Morty's fault though, so I'm not taking the blame for that. Anyway, Chuck should theoretically give us some problems as the fighting type gym leader, so this could be tough. The start certainly doesn't challenge Yara, who one-shots Primate with a critical hit on Return. Polyrath is a different kettle of frog though. Although Return badly injures him, Hypnosis puts Cleffa to sleep, which leaves us in trouble. On the first turn, Polyrath smashes Yara with a dynamic punch that leaves her well below half health and confused. The water fighting type then swings wide of the mark four turns in a row. Like Cleffa is literally just lying there asleep and Polyrath is just punching at fresh air. Seems a little bit incompetent but I'm not going to complain. After running out of PP, Chuck calls for Surf which leaves Cleffa in red health. This battle should have been finished a long time ago but somehow we're still standing. Cleffa finally wakes up and breaks through confusion to hit Polyrath earning us a pretty unlikely win. That makes for 6 gym badges and we're all finished up in Cianwood, so let's head back to Olivine. We go straight to the lighthouse when we return to give the secret potion to Jasmine. She heals Ampharos up and then agrees to return to the gym. Before getting started with this one, we replaced Mudslap with Hidden Power, which for Yara is fighting type. I did test it out while in the whole mess with Morty because several types would have helped, but fighting was just about the worst option. We can definitely make use of it now though. Jasmine leads off with the first of her two level 30 Magnemite, and instead of risking paralysis, we just start off with Sin. Magnemite falls right to sleep, which allows Cleffa to freely attack with hidden power. The fighting type energy is enough to wipe out Jasmine's first Pokemon in one, so after that resounding success, she plumps for another level 30 Magnemite. After the KO on our first hidden power, we repeat that attack and take Jasmine down to one. Her race is Steelix though, and this one isn't going to be easy. Missing back-to-back -back sings isn't an ideal start, but on the third attempt, Yara finally makes contact. While Steelix is sleeping, Clef is able to lower his attack six stages with Charm. That should give us some time. Hidden Power doesn't deal too much damage, but after Steelix wakes up, Clef puts him right back to sleep. After several more attacks, Jasmine uses a Hyper Potion on her ace. A couple more blasts of Hidden Power wake up the Steel Snake, but another miss on Iron Tail will be his last action. Steelix is put back to sleep with Sing and a trio of hidden power attacks finish him off. Alright, after leaving the gym, seven badges in hand, we're sent back to Goldenrod. Team Rocket have been causing problems in the city and we need to take care of it. The first battle of importance back in Goldenrod is our next face off with Spork, and for this one we've taught Clef a Shadow Ball in place of Charm. I really wanted to keep it, but Spork's got his Haunter and with just return and hidden power we can't touch him. For now I sort of need to keep hidden power though and I really can't afford to lose Sing. So this seemed like the best choice. The great news about this face off with Spork is that he's no longer leading off with his ghost, favoring Golbat for the starting spot. Return one shots the poison bat after he gets off a wing attack, so that's an easy start. In fairness, we're a wee bit overleveled here. Clearly Spork isn't in contact with Jasmine because he's also decided to take on Yara with Magnemite. Yep, that didn't go too well. Haunter's up next and as expected that means another curse. Shadow Ball does take down the ghost type to delay it for a turn at least. 
Sneasel's up next and really has no chance against Yara's quad effective hidden power but manages to land a quick attack before going down. That leaves Spork with only Meganium and Cleffa still in good shape. A critical hit on return scores her a 1 hit KO, finishing off our rival with sufficient ease. I'll also show you the final Rocket Executive battle in the Radio Tower but it's not terribly challenging. Morty has really ruined the fun for these last few opponents. Still we've got plenty of tough battles ahead so let's move on to Blackthorn right away. Claire can be a really strong opponent but with a massive level advantage and the use of Sing in return, Cleffa shouldn't have too much to worry about here. The final Johto Gym Leader's Dragonair trio aren't up to much, only managing to paralyze Yara and get in one tame hit. Kingdra's got a big task ahead and it's clearly too much to ask. Cleffa puts the Water Drake to sleep and then slowly attacks in spite of the paralysis. It's a pretty simple victory in the end and that means our badge case is full. Cleffa has taken down the Johto Gym Leader, so it's time to make our way to the Indigo Plateau. We've got one final mandatory battle with Spork and Victory Road before we can take on the Elite Four. For the first time, we're in a big battle against an opponent with a full team of six. Once again, we can be thankful that Spork's no longer leading off with Haunter. If he did, this battle would have been a bit of a nightmare, but instead, it's Sneasel up first. Our entire moveset is required in this one. Hidden Power is ideal against Sneasel and Magneton, returns in use against Golbat and Meganium, and Shadow Balls needed to take down Haunter and Kadabra. Cleffa also put Magneton to sleep with Sing to avoid any paralysis that could have made the end of the battle much tougher. Thanks to Curse, Yara finishes the battle below half health, but it's a pretty easy victory in the end. There's an optional battle with Spork and Mount Moon, but I'll be skipping that, so say goodbye to Mr. in parentheses. The move Curse made everything he did much more difficult, but that was about all he offered. Once upon a time, he was just a simple small town thief, and now, after journeying through Johto, he's a simple small town thief in a cave. That's what I like to call character development. Having finished off Spork for good, we can get going with the Elite Four, so let's get started with Will. I did level Clef up to 70 before facing the Psychic Specialist, because 65 felt a little bit low if we were going to make it past Lance. Anyway, Yara having Shadow Wall seems great, but for some reason the Ghost type was physical prior to the split, because, um, nope, no clue. That one's a mystery. It's still a strong, super effective attack, but Cleffa's attack stat isn't exactly high. Still, it's not too bad. Will doesn't make the best move selections, and we get lucky with a crit against Executor, so one down. Prior to leaving Johto, I spent just about every penny I had on coins so that we could have the TM for Fire Blast when it came time to take on Koga. I really had to think a lot on which moves to use and which to replace, and exactly when to do it. There were a couple of options here, but we ended up teaching Cleffa Fire Blast in place of Hidden Power. Koga probably would have put up a fight if we didn't have it, but yeah, he was not prepared for this. Yara goes 5 for 5 on Fire Blast, taking down Ariados, Venomoth, Fartress, and Muck. Only Crobat is left standing, who does at least succeed in damaging Cleffa before falling to return. Yara is just a total beast, honestly. Now we've got Bruno, though. The fighting type member of the Elite Four should, in theory, be our biggest challenge yet. Cleffa gets off to a perfect start, though, putting Hitmontop and Hitmonlee to sleep and then knocking them out with return. After seeing the one-shot on Hitmonlee, we go for a turn instead of Sing against Hitmonchan. No one would be outsped by Mach Punch anyway, it seemed like the sensible choice. Unfortunately, Hitmonchan survives the hit, so Yara finishes off the Hitmon trio at around half health. Sing is absolutely necessary against Machamp now, and luckily it connects for the third consecutive turn. Bruno loses another Pokemon to Sing in return, taking him down to just Onyx. We go for Sing to play it safe, but our lucky streak ends at 3, leaving the Rock Snake awake. Onyx's Earthquake decimates the battlefield, taking Yara deep into red health. Now we need Sing to work. Cleffa pulls it off to put Onyx to sleep, and from there, a couple of Fire Blasts knock out Bruno's final team member. That was genuinely pretty close, though. We definitely needed a bit of luck, with Sing hitting 4 out of 5 times. Now only one Elite Four member stands in our way. Karen is the last mandatory trainer in the game that has a curse user, so this will hopefully be the end of our nightmare. Cleffa truly breezes past the final Elite Four member. Gengar does succeed in using Curse, but Murkrow is the only Pokemon who actually manages to get a hit in on Cleffa. A single feint attack really doesn't phase Yara though, who has pretty effortlessly dispatched the Elite Four. Alright, we do have the whole Kanto region after this, but for right now, only Lance remains. The champion has a full team of six, and as our moveset's not well set up, we replace Shadow Ball with Icy Wind. That gives us a quad effective move against half of Lance's team, which will hopefully be enough for three one-shots. Gyarados is up first for the champion, and as it has been so many times, the combination of Sing and Return is too powerful. Gyarados is put to sleep and then taken down in a couple of hits. The first of Lance's Dragonite trio comes out second and falls to a single Icy Wind, but it's a crit, so we don't know if it'll be good enough to take down the others just yet. 
We get incredibly lucky against Dragonite number 2 as Lance calls for Thunder Wave, but it fails. That gives Cleffa time to send another Frozen Gust right at the Dragon, scoring another one-hit KO. We've made it through half of Lance's team untouched, but Aerodactyl's up next and he may well be the biggest threat. After failing with Zing, Yara's blasted by Ancient Power, which gives Aerodactyl the unlikely across-the-board stat boost. Thankfully, Sing succeeds on the second attempt and a couple of Icy Winds knock off Aerodactyl. Becoming wary of Sing, we just go straight for return against Charizard. The Firestarter attacks with Wing Attack and Hyper Beam, leaving Clef a weak, but she's able to pick up the win once again. Only Lance's ace remains and Yara is able to attack with Icy Wind before Dragonite can strike. His HP drains all the way down until there's nothing left. Without ever having to truly worry, Clef has earned her place in the Hall of Fame. I'm gonna be honest, I really didn't think we'd be able to do this at a level as low as 73. Anyway, Yara is inducted into the Hall of Fame and now we can head back to Johto so we can sail back to Kanto on the SS Aqua. That makes sense. As I'm sure most of you know, there are only two real challenges left in Pokemon Crystal after you defeat Lance. So let's just take a break, relax, and enjoy Clef at dominating the Kanto Gym Leaders in a very precise and confusing order. Take it away, Yara. Alright, I needed that. Yara really just tore through everything that wasn't a rock type. I did consider replacing moves at times, but I wanted to have Icy Wind available for the face off with Blue, so I stuck it out. Now that we've earned the first 7 Kanto Gym Badges, the Viridian Gym Leader has agreed to take us on, so let's give this a go. Blue leads off with his Pidgeot, who's a pretty comfortable 2 shot with Icy Wind, and thanks to the speed drop, Yara only gets hit once. Alakazam's up next, and he also managed to attack once before falling to return. Still, we're only two Pokemon in and Clef has already lost almost 100 hit points. As we're a little bit behind, I have to go risky against Rhydon and call for Sing. 
Clever pulls it off, but apparently it didn't matter as a crit icy win blows away right on. Gyarados is out fourth for blue, and once again we've got to risk the sing. We get lucky once more, but a full restore wakes him right back up. Two short arm strikes of return leave Gyarados with a sliver of health after a rain dance, but blue uses another full restore. While the water type is recovering though, Clef attacks twice with return, scoring the knockout to take blue down to two. I decided to play it safe against Executor, calling for Icy Wind instead of Fire Blast, but it just comes up short. Egg Bomb weakens Yara further before another Icy Wind leaves us in a one on one. Arcanine's out last, and Blue doesn't call for extreme speed, so Sing puts him to sleep and we can avoid being attacked. Cleffa hits twice with return, knocking out the God Dog to earn us the final Kanto Gym Badge. Now we can leave Viridian and head back to Pallet Town to talk to Professor Oak. As we've earned all 16 badges, he tells us to visit Mount Silver, and that means we can take on Red. Before even attempting this one, I grinded until Cleffa was at level 100 because I don't think there was any point trying at a lower level. We also replaced Icy Wind with Zap Cannon, which was always the plan for this final face off. Yara's holding the Quick Claw, which should help, so let's get this going. Red leads off with his trusty Pikachu, and we call for Fire Blast. I promise you that Cleffa is not quicker than Pikachu, but we get lucky with a Quick Claw pop right off the bat. The flames engulf Pikachu and knock him out in one, so good start. Espeon's up next and we call for a turn, which hits first, but Psychic then deals a healthy dose of damage. Apparently we got another Quick Claw Pop though, so Espeon's able to attack twice, which leaves Yara weak right away. Return finishes off Espeon, but after two team members, we're already in trouble. Instead of going for Sing against Snorlax and having to deal with Snore, we go for Zap Cannon instead to force the paralysis. That pays off incredibly well, with Snorlax unable to do anything as Yara eases past him with a return. Unfortunately, our luck runs out against Venusaur with a missed Fire Blast, allowing Solar Beam to blow Cleffa away. That was a pretty lucky run right there, but we still didn't even get close. There were some issues with the strategy though, so I think we can do this. Let's try again. Alright, on this go around, we once again start with a quick claw pop against Pikachu. This time it's an unnecessary critical hit, but once again it's a one shot and that's all that matters. We've learned our lesson from last time and start off with a sing against Espeon. It connects and Cleffa takes him down with a couple of strikes of return. This is a pretty perfect star. Our strategy against Snorlax worked perfectly last time around, so we lead off with Zap Cannon once again. We get lucky with the attack as Yara's electrical blast makes contact. This time around, Snorlax isn't fully paralyzed for the whole time, but he wastes his only turn on Amnesia, which has absolutely no impact. Another change in our fortune sees Cleffa's Fire Blast hit against Venusaur, but it's not quite enough to one-shot the fully evolved Grass starter. It does leave him burned, but more importantly, Yara's Quick Claw comes into play, so she's able to score the knockout before Venusaur's Solar Beam. Somehow, we've taken down two-thirds of Red's team without being touched. As Zap Cannon isn't the most reliable, we go for Sing against Charizard and it works out. Flamethrower does come first, but it's not too bad. Clef is able to aim her Zap Cannon at the sleeping Charizard and scores a direct hit. It's another one-shot and leaves Red with only a single Pokemon remaining. Blastoise is sent out, but Yara's brimming with confidence. There's no need for Sing this time. She sends another jolt of electricity barreling into Blastoise, but surprisingly he actually survives the hit. For some reason, Red wastes his final turn by calling for Rain Dance and Cleffa strikes again. Blastoise faints and we've beaten the former champion convincingly. When I got started with this challenge, I really didn't think we'd be able to beat Red, but Cleffa is kind of a beast. I would say the Quick Claw was our best friend in this run, but the Everstone was the real savior. The one time I wasn't holding it, I accidentally wiped out like half an hour of progress in the Mahogany Rocket base by letting Cleffa evolve. I thought there would be several troubling battles, but it never occurred to me that ghost types would be the biggest issue. I didn't even consider how much curse could mess us up in a solo run. All in all, Yara sort of breezed through everything outside of Ecritique. This was definitely easier than Azuril in Emerald or Mime Jr. in Platinum, which I really wasn't expecting. Anyway, we've officially beaten Pokemon Crystal using only Cleffa, so yeah, that'll do it. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.